Hello everybody, good morning. Welcome to Dublin. Uh, my name is David Nopton, I'm one of the periodontal postgraduate students in Trinity College Dublin and the Dublin Dental University Hospital. So this morning uh, I'll be talking to you about chemotherapeutic antiseptic rinses in the context of home care using the Costa et al's 2017 study and then secondly professional locally administered subgenital antiseptics and antibiotics using Herrera et al's 2020 study. So if we start with our chemotherapeutic antiseptic rinses first. So the aim of this is to investigate whether chlorhexidine might wash prescription as an adjunct to mechanical periodontal therapy results in probing pocket depth reduction and clinical attachment level gain in patients with chronic periodontitis compared to mechanical periodontal therapy alone. So to put that into a focused PICO question to make it a little bit clearer, our population are those patients with chronic periodontitis our intervention is the adjunct of use of chlorhexidine mouthwash. Our comparison is against mechanical periodontal therapy alone, and our outcome measures are probing pocket depth reduction and clinical attachment level gain. So the literature review for this overall yielded eight different studies after inclusion and exclusion criteria were applied. Um, they were all broken down into two groups. So first of all, those that had scaling root planing in four to six visits, and those that had scaling root planing in within 24 hours. So if we look at the scaling root planing in four to six visits, first of all, we have six studies here ranging from 1986 up to 2015 from five different research groups. So a couple of differences worth pointing out in these studies. The majority of these ones use 0.12% chlorhexidine with one study only using 0.2% and only four out of the six studies gave oral hygiene instruction to the participants. Checkpoints were diverse across the board ranging from six weeks up to six months. Sample size calculation was only done for four out of the six studies and the prescription time for chlorhexidine varied from one to two months. For the scaling root planning within 24 hours groups, there's three studies here from two different research groups. Chlorhexidine concentration was predominantly here, 0.2%, with one study using the 0.12%, but they all use adjunctive chlorhexidine in the form of 1% gel and 0.2% tonsillar sprays. All these studies did provide oral hygiene instruction. Checkpoints, again, were longer but still diverse, ranging from 180 days to 240 days. Sample size calculation was only done for one of the studies, and the prescription time for chlorhexidine is quite diverse here, ranging from uh, 14 days up to over six months to eight months. So the results of the meta-analysis, so overall the trend was that the test groups tended to show higher mean improvements than the control groups for both probing pocket depth reduction and clinical attachment level gain. So looking at the, 20, or the four to six visit group, first of all, statistical significance was only observed for probing pocket depth reduction, and that was only specifically for the 40 to 60 day mark, which was 0.33 mean reduction, and at 180 days, which was um, 0.24 millimeters of a reduction. There is no statistical significance for clinical attachment level gain. The 24 hour group didn't have enough similarity in terms of follow-up times, therefore a meta-analysis could not be done. However, the trend within those studies was still predominant that the test groups had slightly better improvements than the control groups. In conclusion, we can say on this, based within the limitations of those studies uh, that make up the meta-analysis, the patients with chronic periodontitis who underwent mechanical therapy with the adjunct of use of chlorhexidine mouthwash had better results than those treated only with mechanical periodontal therapy. So the EFB statement on this then is that the adjunct of antisepsics may be considered specifically chlorhexidine mouth rinse for a limited period of time in patients with periodontitis therapy as adjuncts to mechanical deprivement in specific cases. Given the level of recommendation, this is an open recommendation. Other factors which this doesn't include, is it's unclear, unclear whether this should be a general recommendation for initial therapy, and indeed if we're recommending it only for specific patients, who are those specific patients and who are those patients that would benefit most from. We may also need to look at optimizing fat control before using chlorhexidine to get the maximum benefit. Adverse effects were not reported or were not included in the study, but tended to include staining on teeth, taste disturbance, uh, more uncommonly mucosal irritation, among other things. Economic factors will vary from region to region and should also be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. In terms of the dental school here in Dublin, uh, this is an open recommendation and it hasn't changed our practice. We're still using chlorhexidine case-specific and on a case-by-case -case basis. So on to our second group of topics, which is professional locally administered subgenital antiseptics and antibiotics. So our aim here is to assess the efficacy of adjunctive 
locally delivered antimicrobials in comparison with mechanical periodontal therapy alone in terms of probing bucket depth reduction, clinical attachment level gain, leading and probing, and patient reported outcome measures in randomized clinical trials with at least six months follow-up in patients with chronic periodontitis. So again, to break that down and make it a little bit clearer, if we apply our PICO question to that, our population again is those patients with chronic periodontitis. Our intervention is the adjunctive use of locally delivered antimicrobials. Our comparison is against mechanical periodontal therapy alone. And our outcome measures are probing pocket depth reduction, clinical attachment level change, bleeding and probing, and patient reported outcome measures. So the literature review for this yielded 59 different papers from 50 different studies. They dealt with six main antimicrobials. Overall, there's a high risk of bias across the board, but the six main antimicrobials identified were tetracycline, minocycline, doxycycline, chlorhexidine, metronidazole, and pepercil and tantabactam. So as clinicians, and what we've come across these products day to day is as brand names or as product names. And it's worth noting that even if two products have the same active ingredient, they may have different concentrations or different, different methods of delivery and so on. So it's worth looking at the differences between some of these. And just to highlight what we actually come across in the clinics and what the product names for these are. So for tetracycline, first of all, we have Actocyte. Minocycline are common products here and, and what's are in the studies are arrestin, dentamycin, and periocline. For doxycycline, we have atriodox and ligosan. For chlorhexidine, we have clocyte and periochip. For metronidazole, we have elizol. And for pipiprocillin, we have atazobactam with periophyll. Now, these are really only of relevance to you and going forward in the presentation, it's only really of relevance to you if you can actually access these products. So there's no point if we say the top one there, the second one there is the best one, if 95% of us can't actually access it and get it in our countries. So I have a table here with the product names on the left-hand side and their availability on the right-hand side. So it's worth taking a second just to identify what country you're in and what product you have available to you and keeping an eye on that product for the rest of the presentation to see how it does. So for example, I'm calling you from Ireland. In Ireland, we have access to two products, so only we have Periocline and Periochip. Similarly, if you're in France working, you have access to periocline and periocline. So when we look at the results of the meta-analysis, overall the combined probing pocket depth reduction data did demonstrate a statistically significant benefit for the test groups in both the short and the long term. So looking at short term, first of all, we had statistical significance for five products, which are here on the left, and in order, so with atrodox actocyte, liposan arrest, and periochip. Overall, the weighted mean difference for products as a whole was just under 0.4 millimeters. Longer term in the 12 to 61 category to site was the one that demonstrated statistical significance and atriodox ligosan and dentamycin all had uh, benefits but were not statistically significant. Overall in this category the weighted mean difference was just under 0.2 millimeters. So although statistically significant in some cases you, one could argue that the actual clinical relevance of those is quite slight. In terms of clinical attachment level in the short term, the combined data did demonstrate again a statistically significant benefit for the test groups. Three products here had significance, so that was ligosan, arrestin, and close site. And um, overall, in the six to nine one category, the weighted mean difference was 0.26 millimeters. Longer term, the 12 to 61 category, the combined data did not demonstrate a statistical benefit for the test groups. Within those, arrestin was the one that had the best results, and then atriodox actocyte, ligosan, and dentomycin all had some benefits also. Bleeding or probing didn't have any statistically significant difference between test groups and control groups. Patient reported outcome measures and adverse events were either generally not reported in a lot of the papers or when they were, they were only vaguely reported. Nonetheless, adverse effects tended to be minor and tended to uh, occur in both the test and the control groups. So we can say from this study that the largest probing pocket depth reductions were generally observed for the doxycycline and tetracycline-based products. So that's your atriodox, actocytes, and ligosans. The minocycline based products, so dentamycin and periocline, demonstrated probing pocket depth weighted mean differences, which are quite similar to the meta analysis overall weighted mean difference, which was 0.36 millimeters. Next, then we had the chlorhexidine based products, so the periochip and clocyte. They demonstrated smaller benefits when we compare them to the previous antibiotics. Then the metronidazole or the elizol and piperacillin and talidobactam didn't demonstrate any additional benefit over the scaling and reclaiming alone. So in conclusion, we can say that locally delivered antimicrobials results in statistically significant benefits based on this study in terms of probing pocket depth reduction and short-term clinical attachment level gain. 
In terms of where to use them, non-responding sites after periodontal therapy or indeed recurrent disease during support of periodontal therapy may represent a fairly reasonable indication for the use of local antimicrobials. The main issue here is going to be country-specific availability. We don't all, as a European Federation, have access to the same products um, and economic factors, again, will be different in, depending on different health services. So locally administered sustained release chlorhexidine or these specific antibiotics as an adjunct to supergingival and subgingival sorry, instrumentation in patients with periodontitis, again, may be considered. This is an open recommendation based on evidence and indeed that we all can't access the same products. In terms of the implementation of the guideline here in the dental school in Dublin, it will be the case for us that we wouldn't routinely use them. We use them case specifically, um, but mostly because we only have access to two of the products, like I said. Um, one of them had better results than the others. So I'll leave you with a picture of our campus from the back of our dental school. And thank you very much for listening and enjoy the rest of the morning. Thank you very much, David. Uh, any question from the panelists? Mose, if I may, just yes. a, a comment. Uh, as you can I have seen, the first uh, recommendation discussed was uh, based on a systematic review that was not performed for the workshop. There was external evidence that uh, the workshop retrieved in order to be able to discuss that particular uh, indication, which was not included in other systematic reviews. This makes it a little bit difficult to compare the way in which that particular systematic re review was performed and the factors that were considered. And this is also the reason because that recommendation has less uh, a less extensive evaluation about the, the additional factors. So this has to be taken into account in order uh, to read properly the recommendation. Thank you very much. As far as I remember, there was a very intensive debate about this aspect uh, at the workshop. 